Hey everyone, welcome to this self-publishing podcast. Today we're going to talk about mid-list author strategies. We, I, I don't know whether this was something that was suggested by um, internally or whether somebody sent this in. I don't remember. I oh, know we got an email that, that just said, hey, um, there's been a conversation in the Smart Artist Group uh, you know, about this topic and we would love to um, hear you guys like do a show on it. And I think we all agreed, yeah, that's a really good topic. Um, and, and it's, well, I, I don't know, I'll get to it when we get to the topic, but, but it's all about mid-list author. And I think finding the show notes for here was, was finding the right hook. And I, I, I had a really interesting time putting these together because it kind of ended up being all about reframing really. But, but we'll get to that when we, when we talk to the topic itself. Well, right. Just to tease it in general though. I mean, often we talk about what big people are doing, people who are, you know, absolutely killing it. And then the, the rest is, you know, like people who are just beginning and, and then, and honestly, our example is kind of neither it's we're Sterling and stone and we're our own animal because we have so much else going on. So this is like, the question was basically, Hey, how about like normal people it was kind of <laughs> <laughs> right. <coughs> because the right publish repeat model has kind of changed things. Um, and I don't mean that we change things. I mean that we happen to uh, name our book really not even thanks to us. That was Shannon Morgan. Thank you, Shannon. Um, with write, publish, repeat, which is just kind of us, you know, taking the pulse of what we were doing at the time and a lot of other people were doing at the time. And then after the book, it became the way a lot of people just did their work, but just it's so much. It's you're constantly having to produce. And what if you cannot maintain that? Or what if your job or life doesn't support that? Then what is your option? Give up or... Yes. You know, <laughs> well, Dave, that's Dave. See, that's what happens when Dave's not here. By the way, for those of you who um, are audio only and you can't see, Dave is uh, missing. Dave's not here, man. <laughs> yeah, we don't know if he, um, if uh, a grizzly bear finally got him or if he, I don't think he's overslept because we saw him on Slack earlier. Although maybe he is sleeping because. He was up all night waiting for the M&M waiting album, the M&M album. <laughs> and it never dropped. I remember, I, I, I think I've read this more than once. I, the description of like you go into a large room and there's a, it's quiet, it's silent. It's like a cathedral, but it still has a sound of silence. You know what I mean? Like, even though there's no sound, it, a large room has a feel that the sound. Oh yeah. Is that like there's a grammar to silence a little bit like that? No, nothing like that. But, <laughs> but you know, it just sounds different. It's like you can tell. You, so if, I guess if I, what I'm saying is if I walked blindfolded into a cavernous space and was totally quiet and walked blindfolded into a small space, I'd be able to tell the difference. And that's the way I feel. Well, it's because like silence has weight, right? Maybe. I mean, that's the way I feel about the show right now is we, Dave doesn't normally say anything. Like I know he would have been like, hello, but that's it. So it's not like we're missing the Dave element so far into the show, but it still feels fundamentally different that he's not here. You know what it feels like to me? It feels like a, a family business episode. Like I'm, I, I'm automatically, I feel a little more serious and- Hate um, has weight, I think might be the way to say that. Hate does have weight. That's a t-shirt. We should add that to the list. Hate yeah. has weight. Family all Business right. is a Stone Table podcast, if you guys are wondering what the hell we're talking about. It's 30 minutes and it's all business, so Dave's never there because Dave is allergic to business and, um, <laughs> and he would pretty much hate the podcast. But it's, uh, it's a lot of fun for Johnny and myself because we're really just talking about all the stuff we basically hold back from on this podcast, on this show, because we don't want to bore the audience who isn't really into a lot of nuts and bolts business stuff. Um, but it's... it's it's kind of a quiet show. It's contemplative. It has its moments of humor, but it's not really about that. Um, it's, it really is more nuts and bolts, but I, I feel a little more serious without Dave here too. Yeah, like my, just my punchlines aren't loud. So do you have a, do you have a something cool? Um, I do have a something cool. Um, well, I, I can't steal Dave something cool because he might still show up, right? Well, it's not. Oh yeah, I guess so. Well, we, you know what? Really, not really is something cool yet. If it's the thing I'm thinking of. Yeah, that's true. As that is true. I checked. Um, that is very true. Okay. Well, um, I'll go with something cool. Um, actually, no, that's just a whole discussion. Bounce to you. Do you have something cool? I need to buy time for like 10 seconds. Yeah, I do. I do. So you didn't come in with a something cool. That's interesting. Well, no, I, I actually did, but, um, but I don't, I don't, I had it like 10 minutes ago. <laughs> but, of course we are without Dave. It's, so, it's a, it's a train wreck. So my topic is, uh, or my, um, my something cool is that, um, for those of you who don't know, 
uh, BookBub is speaking at the Smarter Artist Summit this year. And they recently, we were trying to get them like to narrow down their topic. And they did. Like we know what they're speaking about. They're sending two people. And um, I'm like, just basically getting a, a, a summit boner over it. I'm like, I'm like, this is just, I don't know. I'm really excited. So it's, <laughs> that was awkward without Dave here to make an, an awkward comment. But um, I awkwardly laughed if it made you feel any better. The topic is um, data-driven marketing best practices from BookBub. And I'm just going to read you, since this is, uh, she's gonna, they're going to kind of mash together two proposed topics. I'm just going to read the first because this is going to get monotonous. But the, this is kind of the heart of it. Um, is so this is this is the proposed topic that's going to be the kind of the main thing for that one. Um, Bookbub regularly runs A/B tests on the blurbs in our daily emails, so we have collected ample data from our millions of readers about what makes them more or less likely to click on a book. Our editorial team uses this information to inform their decisions about which books to feature and how to write blurbs that maximize reader engagement. But these insights, while unique to BookBub's audience, can also help authors test and optimize their own book descriptions and promotional copy. Right. And that last sentence is actually my favorite part. It's not, it's not a talk on how to get a BookBub ad. Like, because that doesn't... <laughs> I mean, yes, you want BookBub ads. But what you really want, the why behind that, is you want to know what ad, ad copy converts and why. And actually, that was tied into my something cool. So my something cool is going to be the- Wait, the, can we just bask in the glory of that for a second? Like how fucking awesome is that going to be before you segue over there? Like oh, data-driven I, best practices from the leaders in conversion in the space? Like, Yeah, holy. I think that that's amazing. I think that, I mean, that's kind of the whole way we're building stories to go is around those, um, those exact strategies, those exact concepts, because- it, yes, you want a really good story, but you want a story. If you're trying to write commercial fiction, then, you know, thinking about what the reader expects and wants and will, um, you know, will be gravitated towards what they will click on before you even start that story. Not only is it going to help you make more money on that story, it's just going to keep you aligned. It's going to keep you on the, the rails with the story. The, the one I'm doing right now, the, the, the book I'm, I'm writing that started as a stories to go, again, it's because all of those were, commercial decisions and it's a commercial outline and we took all of that stuff into account ahead of time and i'm flying through the draft it's november 17th as we record this that's my nano book and i'm fifty two thousand words in so I, I i i just couldn't believe in this stuff more uh yeah so it's it's amazing the idea of, of having that so uh those of you who are going to the summit you got something real good to look forward to anyway so uh yes you're something cool um, yeah, so um, w w the one I was going to say was the, the M&M exercise that we did, but I don't know how to do that without getting an exercise, but your book bub thing reminded me of it. Uh, just something we did over the weekend at a, a, a signature event. Um, Dave was not there because it's business and he's signature allergic. Signature event is the stone table mastermind in person thing stuff. Yeah, so we just had a, a little room um, in there and we did, a, we did this exercise where we um, listened to Eminem's newest song. Uh, walk on water and kind of deconstructed it and why it was such a, it really is whether you like that song or not, whether you like Eminem or not, um, because that was the whole exercise. We actually, me, Johnny and Dave recorded a, a little, um, a little recording of it, uh, like a discussion, kind of breaking it apart and saying, why is this an engineered piece of genius? Why, whether you like the song or not, because for the record, Dave doesn't. Uh, he likes Eminem a lot. I mean, he stayed up all night waiting for the, <laughs> the album to drop, which it didn't, has not yet. But he stayed up all night for it. And um, it, he doesn't like the song. So that, that, that's really cool. Like all three of us are fans and we're trying to deconstruct why is this going to be really big? Because it is kind of a piece of, um, of marketing genius, just the song itself. So uh, that's my something cool is, I mean, I got something else for the next episode, but for this one, just take the time to go, you know, listen to the song. It's called Walk on Water. Um, it's five minutes and one second. And um, just listen to it and then think about it. Like, what are you listening to? Why will this song be really big? It's a really fun exercise. Uh, we did it with two different groups um, and then the three of us recorded it and it's had really good feedback so far. I even did it with my family last night at dinner, which was kind of fun. So, um, yeah. You've done awesome. that exercise so many times. Yes, I have now. Four times. I've done it three. Sean's done it four. Yeah. And we, we wanted to do it again. So that I was, I was pretty impressed with um, Haley kind of got them all. Or not all, but she got uh, uh, some of the big points that, you know, we've already seen. 
And she, she had plucked those out, not only the what, but the why, which was really impressive. All right. So let's talk about mid-list author strategy, uh, mid-list author strategies. Wow. That's for some reason complicated for me to say, and I'm not even drunk. Um, <laughs> so we're defining a mid, uh, actually not mid-list. I think it's mid-level. That's probably an important difference. I'm just yeah, because you could be a mid-list author, but because, like with money, but we're defining yeah, especially as your catalog grows and the long tail gets longer and all that. But this is somebody who, I don't, this is somebody who is having a hard time with the whole. Um, oh, okay. Let, let me let me pull this well, back. It's a people bit. who are making you know some money but not enough to live on, right? So it's if if you're living on your on your book royalties right now on your publishing income, then you're not really um, a mid-level author by our de definition, but that doesn't mean that you can't learn anything from this episode, but that's how we're defining them. Yeah, well, when I was kind of getting through these show notes, I, I really, I was surprised to find that so many of the conclusions that, that I reached, and I mean, we, we may come up with something different as we talk together, but it, it really, to me, was about reframing. And in one way, um, I miss Dave a lot this episode because I think that he'd have some real insight here because he is kind of this person. Without us- if you want, I can text Ramon to go hit him with a cattle prod. Do you- oh, I think it's a good idea. Um, you know, it, it's, it's different because it, with, with Dave, he kind of is the author we're talking about here. It's different for him because he works with us and we're kind of constantly pushing it. Right. So even right now with the stuff that he's producing, that's not necessarily where he would have gone on his own. Um, even the collaboration isn't something that he would have gone on his own. And I think that if not a part of Sterling and Stone, this is really the question that he would be asking himself right now. Do I slow down? Do I go faster? Do I go juggle a regular job and try to do this as a hobby? Or do I just double down and get as much product out there as I possibly can? Because if you're neither nor, then you really do have to make that decision. And I think there's actually a, a really good parallel here that um, I think really makes sense. It's gonna sound a little sideways, but I think philosophically it's kind of the same thing. It's the question that we're asking ourselves because we don't have to ask ourselves this other question um, you know, about do we go faster or slower, although we are in our own fiction and we'll get there too. But there's a, an issue with Story Shop right now. I was thinking it, of this exact same thing. Slow down or go faster. Yeah, you want yeah. to talk about Story Shop and kind of where we are there and why well, it's relevant? A little, more, a little more globally because I feel like, I mean, I, I will, I will give that. But, um, but I feel like, so we have this metaphor that which I think all of you listening to this can relate to. We call it, that's, that's $1.99. And what that means is it's the neither nor price. Like if you're setting your books at $1.99 on Amazon, it's kind of the worst price because you're still earning the shitty 30% royalty below $2.99, but it's also a price that looks ugly to people who just want something cheap and who are going to get 99 cent books. So we refer to, um, you know, uh, $1.99 is like, that's our metaphor for something that's neither nor. You got to pick a, you got to pick a side. And I feel like we've been saying that a lot, not just about story shop, but I feel like that's been a theme recently. And it, it's maybe something to pay attention to in your own life. We tend to end up in stasis where we're doing, we're treading water. We're doing kind of just well enough. And seldom is that the right choice. You either listen to what Seth Godin says in the dip and basically quit, not literally, but <laughs> slowing down. That's the cutting out the excess, taking the, 20% effort that makes 80% of the difference and doing something else with your time, opening a new channel or something. You either do that, which is slowing down, or you need to go whole hog and go faster. We tend to end up in this middle ground. Now, the example that Sean was giving about Story Shop is that Story Shop uh, is uh, live and working great. Um, I mean, I use it every day. Sean's been using it. Uh, I have, have 52,000 words of new story in Story Shop. We have... Um, you know, over a thousand users in it now using it. And so it's, it's definitely, you know, it's, 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 it's its own thing. It's, it's good. It's much better than we ever expected, but it's Sean's used this figure and this feels right to me. It's probably 3% of what we want. Now what the 3% that we have is fantastic, but knowing where we want to take story shop, it is about 3% because there's so much more we want to do and add to it. So, um, but that means you need an influx of capital and we've been kind of trickling along. Like we've been just letting it self-fund. Um, we don't take anything out of story shop, but there's, there's, it's, it's a, 
No, it's we pour money into that. Story Shop. Right, yeah. we put money into Story Shop. It's it's kind of dragging. It's an albatross. Um, but because of that, all we can kind of do is fix bugs and and plink along at things. And so Seth actually made this point. He said we need to. He talked to some people. Who, oh, this was Seth. That's right. Yeah, right. He, they'd gotten venture capital. One of his friends had gotten like several rounds of venture capital, and he basically said, you know, talking to this guy and other people I know, we either need to slow down. Or go much, much faster. Story <laughs> shop, which is exactly the same thing Sean's talking about here. Yeah, and I love I love that. I, I'm actually really grateful that you reminded me that that was Seth because I that's kind of how things work. You know, we learn one thing in one place and then it just kind of makes us very aware of our behavior. And Johnny said it earlier, and I'll totally concur. That's kind of been our MO for a lot of places in the company right now. Um and, you know, with stories to go, okay, is it, are we going to tap away at this or are we going to really build this out um, with our own fiction? And we'll get into specific examples there too. Um, but, uh, you know, it's like, well, what, what do we do? Um, you know, with Collective Inkwell, and again, I, I, Dave, fuck you for not being here, but, you know, Collective Inkwell was a really good example because we were exactly in the same position that we were with Story Shop, which is just kind of plinking along and, um, you know, Dave's income really took a big giant hit, at, you know, in the last year because he's, we're not writing, we're not writing for a collective inkwell and that's where the money comes from. So, uh, you know, in the right publish repeat model, you got to put out, you know, several books a year. And I think we did two books last year until we were finally finished with our, our last trilogy. And, you know, that's, that's a direct hit. So the question becomes, well, is that, is that just fine? Is that the kind of authors that we're going to be? And, you know, we're going to really cut back uh, or are we going to go faster? And we'll get to kind of where our, our solutions, you know, for that were a little bit later. But today, I think we just want to define who we're talking to here. And this is a specific author. Um, I mean, we're always talking to, to you, but here, um, these are people who are not writing fast enough to get to that six figure level because six figure is, I think, a, a, a very general number uh, that's thrown around a lot in this space you know, um, six figure author, you know, that is a, a phrase. Um, it's Chris's book, Chris Fox, you know, six figure author, I think six figure makes us think immediately, oh, well, that's a very comfortable life. But if you're trying to become a six figure author part time, that's hard. Um, I mean, certainly you can do it. A lot of people have, um, but it's not easy. And it does take, you know, a, a certain something. Um, there are also people who are wanting to create, you know, training material or or nonfiction books, and they're kind of a, a different category, and people who don't collaborate well. So if you're listening to this right now, and you, um, you, know, you always hear us talking about collaboration and how that really opens the doors um, you know, to getting more work done in less time, especially if you're aiming for quality, you know, more quality work in less time, um, you know, but you, you just don't buy it. You don't, I mean, you're going to hear us talk a lot more about this. It's one of our big themes for the summit. It's one of our big themes for 2018. It is where we see the future going is in collaboration, whether, you know, that means co-writing a book or not. I think, you know, your relationships with everybody who helps you get product to market is a collaboration, ideally, if you think of it that way. Um, and, and people who just aren't really comfortable being that social. So a lot of the growth that we talk about is, you know, figure out what, you know, what hacking is working on Amazon, figure out what ads are working all of that stuff. But if you're not somebody who has a lot of time, you don't want to collaborate, you're not super social uh, and you don't write very fast, what do you do? That's kind of what this show is about. Right. So I think um, you kind of need to decide which side of that fence you're on, um, knowing your why. So basically, I mean, the, the short version of the knowing your why is, is the easier one to explain is if you, if you're honest with yourself and you're like, this kind of is a hobby, you know, do you, do you want to, I feel like there's a, a, a metaphor or a reference here that I could waiting to be born, but I can't quite get it. Um, you know, I, you, well, okay. Are you, are you, I'll, I'll take a stab at this. If it's, if you're like, let's say you're a carpenter because we've done that before compared writing to carpentry. I think we like that. It's the idea of crafting something down and maybe you love to go out to the garage after dinner and, um, you know, you love to, to work on your, your table that you're building. You're building a desk or a table or something. It could be music. You know, I think a lot of people have music as a hobby, but they're not necessarily, um, you know, imagining that they could create a substantial career in music because those are different things. Well, and I think it's important to note that 
writing as a hobby was almost the norm until just a few years ago. That's exactly where I was going, right? It's only because people have gotten to see successful authors and then they're, okay, so I actually have a little bit of a metaphor here. There was an author that we knew who, um, we knew she was going to be releasing a book and it was her first book. And then she, um, it was stratospheric. It was one of those things where it just took off and it was best, you know, New York times bestseller, blah, blah, blah for several weeks. And we were just about to do something that was kind of similar. And, um, I'm, I'm purposely not mentioning names or anything, but you know what I'm talking about, right, Sean? No, I don't. I'm trying to figure it out. Okay. So we were, um, we were looking to, um, to, to launch our thing. And we were like, okay, this, we're, we're going to do well now. Like this is, this is the sort of thing. Cause look what she did. And it was her first book and we got a whole strategy and we're going to, we're going to, we're going to hit the top of the charts. And, and then the, the expectations kept getting higher. And, um, I remember there were a few times when either I thought this or we actually discussed it and we said, well, I know that's not really going to happen, but what if, and you start to think, what if, and you think, what if long enough that it stops really becoming, well, what, if. what if can become, why not? You know, and it's not a reasonable equation that all of a sudden, what if became, why didn't that happen for me? <laughs> right. And you, you, you're talking yourself into it. And, and it's, it's, you basically, you basically set a goal, whatever that is, whether you overtly or, or unintentionally set a goal, which basically means we're probably going to get this. And then, um, and then it, exp- you're just like, oh, well, I could do this. We could do this. We could do this. And then when you hit what would be reasonable, so you have a success. And it, but it doesn't equal that, that what if that you've been thinking of. In this case, that other author that had the stratospheric thing and ours was not stratospheric. It was really good, but it wasn't stratospheric. And then you feel disappointed. And so your expectations are misaligned with your results in terms of thinking it's good or bad when there's absolutely no reason for it. The results are the results. They're what you were shooting for to begin with, but you've set the game up to lose. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's rough because you can have something where – at any other um, paradigm, you'd have thought that was successful. <laughs> but all of a sudden, it's like having um, you know, a sibling who is just really good at everything. And no matter what you do, you just can't measure up. And right now, it's easy to look at the indie community and you think you have all these siblings, right? Because there are all these other people who are just killing it in you know, the indie space. But you don't see the hundreds or the thousands of authors who are not doing anything. Vast majority. Right. Like huge, huge percentage are not doing anything. So is there anything wrong with that? Because going back to the music metaphor, which I really like, I mean, I like the carpenter metaphor, but that's a little harder to imagine that. Right. A carpenter being a a hobbyist is less likely to, a lot of musicians are hobbyists. That's just kind of how it is. Yeah. So it's a better parallel, but I I think, you know, you can upload your own music to, to iTunes, right? But there's not really the same kind of um, expectation that you could just upload a song and it's going to catch on the algorithms <laughs> with the right cover for your piece of music and you're going to you know, make tens of thousands of dollars a month on that single, right? I mean, there's not that same expectation. So there's a lot of people in the music industry that even though they have this potential, you could go do that theoretically, they're also happy to just be craftsmen and, and you know, work on their music and write their songs. And in fact, we had two people in the signature session this weekend who are also songwriters. Uh, One of them is a cover designer, a writer, and a songwriter, you know, and the other one is like a a content manager and a writer and a songwriter. And so that's okay. They're never, but, but both of these people have higher expectations of what they can do with a single book than they could ever do with the, the music, because that's just the space that we live in. So I think at this point, it's just kind of essential to think, what is it? What does success mean to you? And, and, not, and hobby is not a bad word. There's nothing yeah. wrong with it being a hobby. Yeah, not to get too woo-woo on this, but this isn't just a mental exercise. This actually is something that can, in this case, damage you in the future. If you are in a negative mindset, if you're like, my books don't sell. Now, meanwhile, your books might be selling quite well by any reasonable definition. But if you're like, my books don't sell, then you start thinking I'm a failure. What am I doing wrong? That's not a productive state to do more good work. Not at all. And if you look historically, you know, let's say your book sold a couple thousand copies. Historically for a book, not bad at all, right? 
but compared to everybody else around you, that's, that's, that's horrible. That's not main, you know, you can't maintain a career. That's not, that's really, really far from six figure author. And oh my God, you're gonna have to do that 10 more times this year to make this worth your while. And I think that's a big mistake. And I think that it's a really slippery slope. I think you get down to the bottom and you feel like shit and it's really hard to surface out of that. And then, you know, like you just said, it becomes really difficult to create substantial work or, or to um, express who you, you are as an author because you're just kind of worried about not being good enough. And I think that's terrible environment to create your best work. So I think it's much more important to figure out what makes you most content and then just do that thing. And it may not be driving for a book a month. That might be ridiculous. And there are some people who that clearly is, is ridiculous. And yet they're just like swinging the pickaxe as hard as they can anyway. Is it too early for me to mention some of the changes that we've made specifically at Realm and Sands? No, I mean, it's the, that makes perfect yeah. sense. Okay, actually. So, so this is, um, this is actually a realization on the, this is, it's so not exactly the same thing, but it's similar. It's sort of on the hobbyist side, on the side of what we've just been talking about. Um, where uh, Sean and I used to, well, I mean, Sean has the additional stuff of working with Dave and other authors and stuff, but, um, you know, we, we, we produced Fast and Furious and um, that used to kind of be all we did uh, with minor exceptions. And then we started adding more and more stuff. The company, now, the, I want to say there were 25 people in our last company meeting, uh, something like that. It's a lot of management. We're doing story shop. We're doing stories to go. We're holding live events. Um, in large and small, like there's just a lot that's going on at Sterling and Stone right now. And so it takes up a large part of, like writing takes up a proportionately smaller part of my day than it used to and Sean's day. And so um, we, it's really hard for us as the people who said write publisher Pete to write <laughs> Pete, interestingly. And so... Well, look at the the change in the landscape since we wrote that too. I mean, after you finish your thought, we should bat that around for just a couple of minutes because it's really worth noting. Because if you don't look at, if you don't observe how things are changing and then change along with them, you're going to get left behind. Well, so let me, um, I mean, let me finish that thought. But basically, we it was doing a few things. Um, number one, I chronically felt behind because I just can't deliver 6,000 words a day anymore. It's not reasonable. And it wasn't reasonable then, but like for me, I had <laughs> my own standard and I felt that I needed to do it. And so I always felt behind. I, I, yeah. And just as an observer, it affected your mood. You know, it affected a lot. the way you felt about yourself. And I think that for people who are creating art to sell, we need to feel good about ourselves. And it's really hard when, you know, I mean, it started, I think, with the invasion series and the end and when you were moving. That's when it first kind of got off track. And then through circumstance and business and one thing after another, it just kind of never got back to where you would have been happy with where you were before until you reframed it. Right. And so what we ended up, um, and also just, it, it does become, I mean, any of you who are, who are writing series, especially if you go back and forth, you're familiar with this. It, series are hard to write if you don't write them straight through. I mean, they're hard anyway, but they're hard to write if you don't write them straight through because like, shit, I can't keep track of the lore. And even if you're using Story Shop, you still can't keep track of all the little things. You'd have to go read it all. Um, and it, if you go back and forth, and I got to remember it, I got to read the whole series. And so the, the bottom line effect was, number one, we felt behind. Um, early on, there was a thing where we were talking about self-imposed deadlines. I'm talking years ago on the podcast. And Sean quoted me, and I was pleased to be quoted saying, bitch, I don't miss deadlines. Well, guess <laughs> what? I miss deadlines all the time now. And <laughs> reframing it. And so I'm aware that I never used to miss deadlines and now I was, um, it felt behind. And the standard that we set in terms of write, publish, repeat was falling behind too. Like we weren't right publishing and repeating enough, which is absurd given the amount that we had been putting out. And it just wasn't fun. Like the sum total was it became a lot less fun. And so what we ended up deciding is we're kind of partitioning some of our imprints and um, we're doing a production model where we can work with other people to produce the commercially driven, right, publish, repeat, faster stuff that we want to do. But personally, for Realm and Sands, for Sean and I, um, we're going slower. Like we actually decided to, we said speed up or slow down. We've, we've slowed down on purpose and writing intent. I mean, we have some stuff to tie up, but then eventually just, just big standalones, like Stephen King style 
single book, but larger meteor, taking our time a little more. The book I'm writing right now, um, I just today, just today, for the first time in forever, hit 4,000 words. And I've been plinking along at 2,000, 2,500 a day, which for me felt slow. But, but, it, but to be clear, that's still how much Stephen King writes a day. And he used to be like the godfather of word count. How could he possibly work so fast, right? Yes. But that's the point is that I keep, and I keep, Sean will tell you, I keep going back and I keep saying, can I basically have permission to be okay with going? I'm going, I'm not going to go slower, but is it okay that I'm going slow? Is it okay that this book is months overdue at this point? And the answer isn't always a firm yes, because we have other obligations to meet, but the more and more we give ourselves that permission, especially in the long term, the better we are meeting our own expectations because we've decided the why in advance for those particular books. So well, we I love the I love this example because it really is um, exactly what we're talking about here. Now we're in the fortunate position where we could choose and instead of or, but the examples are all here. Now what we're doing with um, Collective Inkwell is exactly the same, and what we're doing with um, uh, Eros is exactly the same. So Johnny and I write romance, um, but we write romance that gets lost in the weeds and, you know, becomes more complicated than the typical romance reader probably wants. The most commercial romance is the same thing, but different. We yes. do complicated okay. overarching story arcs. Yeah, we had, so we, we came up with a, a series that was highly commercial um, in title and tone and all the stuff that, you know, we were, planning on doing the, the idea itself was really commercial and the original concept was okay we're going to be able to write all of these books in the series and there's no reading order so we're going to be able to get book bubs for book five and it doesn't matter it'll promote the whole entire series well by book two there was a reading order that was mandatory <laughs> so we're not really capable of, <laughs> of doing we that are accepting that we kind of aren't capable at this point. Like it, it is literally that language. Our minds don't work that way. Yeah, but we, you know what we're good at? We're, coming, we're good at coming up with the commercial hooks. We're good at coming up with the titles. We're good at coming up with the copy, um, wh you know, which is why Stories to Go is, is strong because that's taking the stuff that we're really good at, which is, you know, pre-optimization. But as far as articulating what a commercial writer wants or a reader wants, we don't want to really write that way, um, especially at Roman Sands. It always gets away from us and that's fine. Like we're trying to not, um, we're trying to be okay with that. You know, it's instead of chasing this, then why don't we slow down? So, so we did choose slow down and speed up, slow down in Eros. Both, to be clear. Yes. Right. So in Eros, we're just writing the kinds of um, romance books that we want, but we have two series that are in production that are highly commercial at Realm and Sands. Um, we are going to very much write the kinds of books that we want, but we have, um, and, and in the inevitable world is where we're, we're staying right now um, for Johnny and I, and we have two other writers who have joined the family and they're both writing, not just commercial production work um, in this world. Uh, I mean, for us, but in this world. So it's a way for us to both go slower, write what we want and go faster. And the same thing for uh, Dave and I at the Inkwell, where we're taking our time. We have one more box to close. That's it. It's white space. We don't have things as um, cut and dry over at Realm and Sands just because we have more open boxes. So it's actually going to be a couple of years before we're fully where we want to be, where we're just back to, to standalones and high concept ideas articulated exactly the way we want to. But oh man, are we excited to get there because I think that will be the sweet spot for, for, for Johnny and myself to be able to write those and map out other books. And with Dave and I, we're, we're creating our stories. And once white space is done, that's what we're gonna do. Just only the stories that we wanna write and really leaning into Dave's production. So there's, there's two things here. With Realm and Sands, it's not a production itch, issue. Um, despite Johnny saying, you know, he's slowing down, we come up with the right concept. He's gonna write it like ridiculously fast. And that's still not really the issue. Yeah, and to be clear, 4,000 words on the particular project I'm doing today is really fast. Because yes, because this is, this is, it's difficult stuff. It is not a high paced or fast paced commercial fiction at all. Um, it's, it's very meticulous writing like that has lot. to be done. Yeah. And so with, with Realm and Sands, it's not, it's a production thing. It's not a production thing. It's a commercial fiction thing. You know, we're just a little bit more verbose. Um, with Dave, it's the opposite. Uh, Dave isn't verbose at all. Uh, 
collective inkwell is commercially written um you know tight clean copy um the pages really move but dave's also not going to write more than you know maybe three books a year <laughs> right there's all there's a limit to what he can write and um I, i'm starting to add to that you know library a little bit but still there's limits there but there's not really nearly as strict limits to how much we can produce so working with other writers and really encouraging them to get as commercial as possible in the way that they write um, and working with writers who have those sensibilities to begin with. Um, that's a way for us to have our and. And for you guys listening to this right now, anybody listening to this, just decide, do you want to slow down? Do you want to speed up? What is it that you can do to reframe what you're doing right now? Not to necessarily change the outcome, but to dramatically affect the way you feel about that income because or that outcome, because that will change your approach and your life. Yeah, not just to reframe, but um, to, I, I had an end to that sentence and, and I, don't, I don't remember it. Awareness, like awareness, consciousness. Um, I mean, this has been a theme all through everything before I was even writing books. The, um, if you even look to, back to the Johnny 1.0 days, the idea of conscious decision-making and stuff has been a big thing because humans always end up on autopilot and we think we're steering towards something. And if you don't stop and recalibrate, it's like the metaphor, if you've ever heard the metaphor, <clears throat> if, a, um, you know, if a jet is flying from uh, Sydney, Australia to uh, Honolulu, Hawaii, and it's off by just a fractional degree, oh, yeah. you end up way the fuck out of nowhere because the distance is so long. And that's your life. If you don't recalibrate and, and always be nudging back to, to where you really want to end up, then you won't end up where you want to end up. And that's what happens with, with everybody. And so um, what, this sounds a little Pollyanna, but I would almost... I would, I would say to let your, um, your, your mood be your guide in a, in a way, because um, you want what makes you the happiest. This is why this sounds Pollyanna, but just stick with me. And I, and I think this will make sense. No, I'm, I'm totally with you, dude. Yeah. Is I think that a lot of people start out and they feel that what would make me happy is to make a bunch of money and the corollary is often quit my shitty job that I'm working my face off at this shitty job. So I'm going to, I'm going to earn a bunch of money making books and then I'll be able to quit my shitty job and then I'll be happy. But what happens is you work really, really hard at writing so much that it isn't fun for you. Now, some people like to work at a frenzied pace. What I'm saying is I was decreasing my pleasure to do that and to, to steer away from topics I would have rather delved in more in the interest of trying to be commercial and then not doing it, not being commercial. And if, if you keep doing that, and you don't stop and ask, is this making me happier than what, en what ends up happening is you end up with writing, which is supposed to make you happy, being another shitty job that you hate. And would you rather be exactly. less money as a part-time thing and enjoy it more? You know, you just need to define what is success, what is enjoyment, what, is, what are your parameters and always be looking to recalibrate on them. Yeah, we've done a lot of recalibration um, in, the, in the company this year um, in all of this stuff, not just what we have to produce, but how we feel about it, um, you know, what our expectations are of our work, of our compensation, um, of just uh, like the collaboration in general. And that's exactly it. You, you, you have to frame it right so that you feel good about it because that really affects it. And, and we're all creators here. We have to feel good about what we're doing. Um, and I think you, you want to build, you want to craft whatever you're doing around what is sustainable and what is enjoyable and use the language, not just when you're telling other people what you do, but when you're telling yourself, if you're trying to be a six figure author and that's your number one goal and your number two goal and your number three goal, and you know, you made $9,000 publishing last year, you're going to feel really shitty. You got 9% of your goal and you probably worked really hard for that. But if you if writing is your hobby and you made an extra $9,000 last year on your hobby, that's a really awesome thing. So why, why are there people who feel terrible about making almost $10,000 on a hobby instead of, right? And what do you think those percentages are, Johnny? Do you have any idea? Like what, what do you think, how many people out there do you think are doing actually pretty well if they think of it in terms of, wow, I spent $1,200 on my hobby plus you know, X number of hours and I made 10 grand versus fuck, I spent this much on my, on my, on my author business and I didn't even come close. Well, I feel it's getting more and more. I mean, this is a slippery slope that we're on. Another thing that I've, I've heard and that I've heard people mention, refer to that they've heard is people who 
go on vacation and feel guilty about it. So, oh my God, I went on vacation for, for five days. I was um, visiting my, uh, my mother in Seattle and I haven't seen her in forever and I love her, but I, I didn't write or I only wrote 1,000 words a day and that sucks. Dude, when I go on vacation, I don't write. That's not how I'm wired. Sean does because he likes it. But I want to be off. I'm binary. I'm either on or I'm off. And the number of people who, who insist on, who feel bad about taking any time off, that's just hamster wheel shit. You start feeling, man, I'm producing a book a month and it's not enough. I'm producing a book a quarter and it's not enough. That's not good. And, and it's not sustainable. Yeah. And that's where I was going with the, the business decisions that we made this year is that you're always you're always on top of that. I mean, Johnny will say, nope, I want, I want less hours. I want less money. I want more control over my schedule. <laughs> and mm-hmm. it's all about choice. You know, Johnny is very good at defining what he wants. And sometimes he needs to be re- reminded, you know, like he needs to remind himself or it, circumstances need to remind him or whatever. And he says, oh yeah, that's not what I wanted. <laughs> and then recalibrate and go to the thing that he wants. And you can't just go through things with blind automaticity yeah. because life taught you to step onto one path two years ago or three years ago. And now you're just walking down there and the weather has changed and the environment has changed and you just keep walking and you haven't grabbed a sweater. And that's a problem because then you don't know why you're doing anything. And so I, I know, we, you know, one of the things that we talked about early in the show was, you know, collaboration and that this was for people who, you know, didn't really buy into collaboration. But do you think it's worth talking a little bit about why that might be an erroneous assumption? And if you think you don't like collaboration, but you are still driven to be a six figure author, why that might be worth some reconsideration? Yes. And I was going to detour to add a story to the last thing before coming back to collaboration. But if I'm lucky, I can tie this in because of what you were just saying at the end there is Sean actually started to tell part of a story that, um, that I was actually going to say. And so um, my son has gotten much better about this, but he had a real nasty habit of a, for a while of not having something. And then I would say, well, you need to do this to have that. You need to do it. And then he would, um, it would become apparent that he didn't really want to do that. And I said, you can't, you either have to decide that you're okay not having it or do the work and, and work toward it. You don't get to stay where you are, not do anything and bitch. Like that doesn't mm-hmm. work. And what's funny is I had told this story to Sean a few times and then there was something that we were having a, 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 a discussion about and um, he threw it right back at me. Because I was like wanting something and he's like, sorry. So, so do this and then you can have it. And I kind of had this moment where I went, oh, you're right. I don't want it badly enough. And being reminded of that, that I am making a conscious choice to not do something takes away the, the you don't want a bitch because you realize, oh, that's a decision. That's a decision. I could do more. I could have more, but I don't want to do it. That makes it conscious again. So where you were going with this was where I was going to try and tie it back into this was with collaboration is that a lot of people say they don't want to collaborate and there's not really a good reason for it. Like, and again, we're defining collaboration broadly. Like we're not saying you and you work together, write a book the way we do. That's not it. It's working with at all hiring. It's um, having par- partnerships of all sorts of different kinds. And a lot of times I'm guessing the reason that people don't feel that they can collaborate or don't want to move into that is this sort of thing. So I want to move faster. I want to do a lot more. And then you say, oh, well, okay, here's how you do it. And they go, oh, no, I, I don't want to do that. It always reminds me of, when there's, there's a certain type of, per- I used to see this, I was in a, 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 like a weightlifting community for a while, cue the abs references. And people would come in, they'd be like- You're so buff, Johnny. Like, I want to I wanna come in, I want to I get big and I want to get strong and here's how I'm doing it. And people who knew would be like, okay, but that's not right. Do it this way. Like, this will get you the results. And they'd say, oh, well, I want to do it my way. I don't want to do it that way. <laughs> Motherfucker, you're not going to get the result if you do it that way. And so I think that's kind of how I feel about how some people are with collaboration. Yes, it takes more- you have to find people, you have to manage logistics. To some extent, you have to manage people. Um, you have a relationship, a new relationship, but that's how a lot of times you can, you can move forward if you want to do that. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. And I think that a lot of this, it's, it's uncomfortable because it's almost like you have to say goodbye to a dream and people see it that way. 
right? So if I'm saying goodbye to, if I'm deciding that this is just a hobby, then I'm saying goodbye to that, you know, um, you know, six figure author dream, and I'm going to be stuck at my shit job forever and all of that. But you know what? That's not necessarily true. You could treat it like a hobby, build a catalog over a three, four, five year period. And then when your life is different, maybe your children are at a different stage, you can, you know, carve more time out of the day. There's this immediacy that is just, I think, really destructive. Um, that's in this space. It's, it's in the indie author space that this is, I mean, you know, impatience, it's impatience and that time is running out and, you know, like it's just not. And I know if you're listening to this, you, there's a good chance you're already tired of hearing about this, but 2018 <laughs> is we've been preparing for, for a long time. That was our whole thing going into 2017 and really even back in 2014, 2015, we've been saying that 2018 is our year. And we've been a little bit impatient here and there for sure. No doubt about it. Everybody is. But by and large, this company has been able to iterate the way that we have. We as individuals have been able to creatively grow and feed our families and be both inspired. And I- I'm actually excluding Dave from this because <laughs> he probably would have been miserable Fired. under any circumstances. And inspiration isn't a word that he really bandies about. But, but it is true. We've been inspired. We've been driven. We've been creatively fulfilled. And we have been um, financially rewarded by being patient and by constantly reassessing what it means for us to be successful. And that's not always about our, our dashboards. And in fact, for me, it rarely is. Johnny will tell you there was been, there's been like six-month blocks of times where I have not looked at the dashboards once. And that might be even taking it to the wrong extreme and a little foolhardy because you should have your eye on stuff like that. But the point is I never wanted that to be where I got my fulfillment from your compass. Right. Uh, You know, am I, am I writing things of value? Am I, uh, you know, with smarter artists, the question has to be, are we scaling through impact? Are we making a difference? Because even right there, if we're, if we're talking about having, you know, profitable months on smart artists, we would have pulled the plug a long time ago, but (laughs) very long time ago. But that's not, that's not the point. The point is, are we accomplishing the things that we set out to accomplish? So if your number one goal was just to make money with writing and you're not making money, then go find something else to do. Like there are easier ways to make money actually right, right. now online. So indie publishing, it's not 2011. It is going to be kind of a grind to build out a career. So if that's what you want to do, then be reasonable about all the steps that it's going to take to do that. If that's not what you want to do, then pretend it's five years ago and a few books a year is kind of amazing. And if you can make you know, a few extra thousand dollars for something that is deeply satisfying to you, because think about this, like, so what if it is a hobby and you're able to you know, be a part of a really great community that you enjoy and you know, you're able to talk to people, like whether it's um, you know, uh, Michael Anderley's group or the Smart Artist Group or wherever, you know, you're able to Um, be with like-minded creative individuals who are talking about their work and what's working and not. And you're a part of that community. Don't compare yourself to um, them. Just be glad that you have kind of an antidote to the job that you hate instead of trying to turn a hobby into another job that you hate. Because Johnny will tell you, we know a lot of people who are very successful authors and are kind of hating it. Yeah. These aren't mid-level people. These are people who are doing very, very well financially and they hate it. They're like, yeah, it might be a be careful what you wish for type of situation. They can't, you know? they can't stop there. They're, and actually, let me broaden, maybe as we close this out, this might be a good way to, to I want to broaden this a little bit. So we've been talking about the writing being the thing you need to do, but um, something happened in the, um, the, the stone table, the, uh, the stone table is really, we have a really active discussion group. It's, there's a bunch of new stuff in there every day. And there was this whole thing recently where um, I posted something, which I'll tell you. Oh yeah. In a minute. And um, a bunch of people, there was this great sense of relief. And everybody's like, oh, thank God. Thank God you said it because I feel so obligated. And there, there are a lot of those things where we feel we need to be doing X, Y, and Z, or we are not doing publishing right. We're not doing writing correctly. Some of those things are produce a book a month. You know, um, if, you're a, if you're a nonfiction person, you think, well, I'm, I must need to speak. So, okay, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to grind and I'm going to get speaking gigs, but you hate it. Like that's an obligatory thing. So for me, it was social media. Um, I, I, 
I had a brief honeymoon where I liked social media because it was just, it was new. It was with, um, with our romance line and it was new, but I've never been a Facebook person. Never. I just, I don't get it. I'm not native to it. It just doesn't make sense to me. Um, I find it distracting and a little indulgent and I get lost on the rabbit hole and um, I'm susceptible to like, I don't, I'm susceptible to negativity in, in kind of a weird way. And in Facebook, when people are posting about all the things they think are going wrong or going to go wrong, or here's some hate shit that's happening or whatever, then suddenly I've taken that in and it affects my mood. So I was having a really negative experience. Now, actually, I want to couch that. In general, the people were fantastic, but the environment is not native to me. And so I was doing Facebook under for our romance stuff, and it became one of those things where it was like, okay, well, I need to find content to feed this. And then we opened a group and I need to find content for the group. And, and it was just sucking a lot of my time. And again, I'm not Facebook native. And so I, I began to like, oh God, I got to go there and find stuff to do. And then I'd get messages about, um, hey, pass this meme photo along to all your friends in Messenger. And I so don't give a shit about that. So I, um, sh- we shut it down we shut down um, the page and the profile and just vanished from Facebook. And when I explained this in, um, I think two or three separate videos to the table from different angles, the people in that group were like, Oh, thank God. You don't need to do social media. Everybody says there was so much relief. It was like the entire table exhaled. Yep. And that's the thing. If you don't like doing something, it's okay not to do it. It's okay. In fact, it's preferable that you don't because it's not adding anything to your life and it may be very well subtracting. It probably is. And what are you giving to the people? You're giving them a hollow echo of whatever it is that they want or that you could provide because you don't it's actually- not fair to them. Yeah. You're wasting their time too. But yeah, everybody, like Sean said, it was an exhale and they didn't want to at first. They were a little like, Oh, but don't you need to do this? And don't well, you there was a lot of, can you please explain the reasoning right. for that? Because I, you know, it just doesn't make sense to me. And it's, it's everybody. so counter to everybody else, what everybody else says. And you know what? Fuck what everybody else says. Reframe for yourself and do what's best for your life. So we may make a little less money through Facebook on that particular line. But the, the other thing is that, um, that it, wasn't, it, wa- it wasn't necessarily doing what we wanted anyway. So it wasn't having the the effect, and it was um, and it was draining. And so, but what the point I was trying to make to the table is: look, we will make less, maybe, but not a lot, I don't think. But look at it's eighty twenty. How much time are we going to get though? Time and energy and stuff. So, so anyway, that was that was it. And I'm going to give a special guest hello to uh, Mark Lefebvre, who I see showing up. He's actually on the podcast we're recording next. But he showed up early, so we're gonna we're gonna hang out as a silent uh, visitor. But anyway, so hey, Mark, you just missed the first episode that Dave totally missed. <laughs> <laughs> He's over there. Could I have like brought in some darkness to this one in his in his stead? I, I think so. Hello, darkness, our old friend. So uh, if you're interested in in uh, hearing about about Mark uh, and and Kobo and stuff, we'll, we're gonna talk to him next. I don't know if it's next on the live feed, but anyway, to close the loop on this episode. And hopefully Dave will join us for the next one. Um, you just need to reframe that. You need to know, slow up, slow down, or go faster. And accept that where you think you need to be is probably not in tune with reality. It's probably a lot of comparisonitis. Yep. So with that said, um, we'll conclude this episode of the Self-Publishing Podcast. Feels really odd to not have Dave around, but at least we have Mark. So it's hey, good. Mark. <laughs> Oh, I, I hang on. I got to go get the kids in my basement. <laughs> I'm sure they're ready to right, come up for You can be Dave on the next show. So th- for the rest of you, thanks very much for watching the Self-Publishing Podcast, and we'll see you next time.